Welcome to Pyramid One World Radio Network. You can call in and talk to our hosts by dialing 6054725766, then dial the access code 608060 hash, and you're ready to be part of a worldwide movement to educate everyone listening to these shows. Let's begin dialing. This is a Pyramid One International Network presentation. Dr. Randall George Nazawa welcomes the world to his new show right here on Pyramid One Radio Network called Be the Change. First, a little bit about your host. Dr. Randall George Nazawa had played high school football in Honolulu and later became a professional bodybuilder. When he moved to Washington, the muscle bound Nazawa enrolled at University of Washington's Dental School studied hard and faithfully graduated. Dr. Nuzawa became to be a prominent dentist and years later he opened a handful of dental clinics which now through his work could finally afford the lifestyle he had always wanted. Then a tree came crushing down and foiled his best laid plans. This was one of two life-changing tragedies that changed his life forever. During his resulting and prolonged stay in the hospital, and as he took a year to learn to walk again, his wife, Deborah, hired temporary dentist to keep the clinics open. Yet, when the businesses performed poorly under the temporary staff, family finances plummeted. And with all his medical bills accumulating, the Zara felt he needed to return to work, but could not. That's when Nuzawa realized he could not perform his dental duties to the high standard he was accustomed. The accident took away his sight, and even with assistant devices for the seeing of pair, he felt his dentistry skills were now substandard, which made him have to close his clinics to so many patients that loved him so much and the work he did for all of them. Then again, tragedies hit again. And this time, he came close to death. Dr. Randall George Nazawa, now blind, got caught in the middle of a couple's domestic violence incident on one fateful night. The heat of the domestic violence, Dr. Nozawa was shot in the head from 12 inches away. The crime shocked and rocked the community of Gig Harbor, where it occurred, and received its due amount of attention in the area newspapers. Looking back on it, Nozawa said that getting shot feels like thumping your forehead with the heel of your hand. It does not hurt. He did not yet know that the bullet had shattered and bore a hole through his palate, destroying molars, nearly severing his tongue and destroying his only eye. All he knew was that he could not see and he was bleeding. Dr. Reddle George Nuzawa, after all his pain and enlivenment, enlightenment due to -to near-to-death experiences. Now, the doctor is here for the world and you, the audience, to learn, listen, 
and awaken. Some of the subjects he's going to touch on are the eight pillars of wellness, which are nutrition, mental, emotional, physical, spiritual relationships with self, others, with the environment, management of toxins, finances, many of the new technological advances that have brought many solutions and conveniences, but also more new problems. And sadly, greed, power, and sex. Food that's no longer fresh from the earth and our water has been hijacked and contaminated by the big agricultural businesses or chemical companies like the ones we know about and poisoned with herbicides or insecticides and antibiotics, petroleum products stored in chemical leaching plastics filled with illness causing GMOs and used as a political fodder to control humankind infecting us with diseases and making us beholden to the pharmaceutical criminal or criminal racket. Combine the enormous stresses of earning an income in activity because of work requirements and travel, the toxins building up in our bodies, divine gifted bodies and sliding further down a sinkhole of hopelessness and helplessness. Humankind is suffering, suffering, suffering and dying. Call the doctor today on his shows. Talk to the doctor. Listen to a show that will probably be a number one daytime listening show on or before the year 2020, I predict. With great respect, it is Pyramid One Worldwide Radio Network's honor to introduce Dr. Randall George Nazawa. Oh, yeah. Doctor, it's all yours. <laughs> you, know, you know, Bobby, every time I, I hear your voice, it's, uh, you know, to me, it's like coming home. <laughs> you know, well, well, no, yours is a one of uh, not only knowledge and authority, but uh, security. You know, and that's what I, I get from you and, and Pyramid One and, uh, you know, not, not being the, the tech savvy blind person that, you know, a lot of my, uh, my, my friends are uh, and all that. Uh, you, you, you've got to put up with all this uh, tech things that are just way beyond me. And like we were talking about yesterday, when, when things change, kind of up to you to figure it out. Well, <laughs> I get to listen to my mechanical voice on my uh, on my computer here, and that, that's as uh, friendly as I get. So I thank you for uh, you know. <laughs> well, you know, someone's got to figure this out, and I, I well, who do I call? Well, I don't, I don't know who to call. So I, I called you. So you called me, right? Yeah, exactly. And you, and you see, and that's uh, uh, you know, just where you come from and where you, uh, you know, bring your show and why, why you know, I think that uh, you, you know your show so popular, uh, and your channel is is that you you bring honesty. And, and truth and all that and that's why if you can uh, you know in, in your uh, spurs here and there with the uh, American Party I would like that because you know with, with our guest here Nazarene uh, who just rounds up uh, uh, this January this 2020 and you know better than the show it's it's 2020 uh, you know she 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 brings leadership uh, to our world and you know many of you will probably never have heard her but what she does uh, with with uh, her love for things and for for love of doing things for creation for helping, this is the kind of people we need more of in our world. And uh, you, you know she gets to be on this show, and you know that's because of you. Thanks to you. And, and so the, the you know show like this uh, can reach uh, 138 different type of countries and uh, 
all of us are looking for something, but uh, a lot of times we don't know who to ask or uh, who to get advice from. And so what they get from me, what they get from you is truth, honesty, and just a back of a whole bunch of love behind it. Because uh, if when, when we have the right information, that's up to us to make those kind of decisions that would help us out and help our families out. And that, that's thanks to you in Pyramid One. But, but for uh, my guest, uh, what, what a great January this has been too with, with uh, uh, you know, Nasreen is, uh, you know, she uh, was the, well, I think still is the, the current CEO of this organization called Project Starfish. And this organization, and she, she'll uh, add to this uh, in a moment here, uh, you know, creates a lot of great training uh, for uh, blind and disabled people out in our world to help ready them for the workforce or to get that entrepreneurial bug in their head that, hey, you know, maybe I can be self-employed. Maybe I can invent something or create something or do something or do something that I love and somehow monetize it. How can I better the world? And that's what I uh, gather out of uh, Project Starfish. And what this great organization did, and, and this is through Nazreen, is that uh, I had my first uh, international audience, thanks to her and Project Starfish. So that, that was an incredible, uh, wonderful experience. And in this new 2020 year, uh, I, I've never forgotten her. I, I've, uh, I always remember her leadership and her kindness and a teaching skill and bringing out the best in people. Okay, and, and especially those who are, you know, call them differently abled, um, handicapped, wh whatever you want to call it. But uh, all of us have a place in life and, and uh, we all need to band together uh, you know, as uh, you know, our human uh, species uh, should go to make our world better, but we can only do it if we work as a team and together. And uh, but we need leaders for that. Uh, Nazarene is one of them. So uh, I I'm so glad she could make it onto the show, and uh, you know what she's done in her life by just living it and showing people who she is. She's a leader. Who cares? And, uh, you know, just like you, Bob, and just like Pyramid One, this is the, the premise of not only this show, but I think how we all should live. So, Nazreen, welcome. Thanks, uh, Dr. Randall, for having me on uh, Pyramid One. Thank you, Bob Charles. Good to be here. Uh, thank you. you know, she no. said, hey, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Nazreen, uh, uh, just to uh, get uh, the audience to know more about who you are, can you reveal a little bit of uh, your earliest rememberings as a child, you know, then growing up and then from there, uh, uh, you know, kind of looking at life and then, you know, how you hooked <clears throat> up with uh, Project Starfish? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for those uh, who don't meet, know me, I'm actually, um, I reside in Toronto, Canada. And, um, <clears throat> you know, growing up in, in Canada, I mean, my God, it's, it's, evolved it's changed so much from like where when I was a little girl here um you know I mean <clears throat> there was a lot of farmland here when I was growing up and you know I kind of saw them you know put everything in the whole development in from like our first plaza to you know there was only one or two schools nearby and they had kind of etched out uh, a median in the city sort of in the center which today is kind of like a highway and Truth be told, um, <clears throat> if I kind of uh, go back those many years, I remember farmlands on those uh, four corners where <laughs> there's an intersection now. <clears throat> Pardon me, I've had a cold um, and just recovering. Um, so yeah, and you know, a very small town, of maybe thirteen thousand back back then, I'm just sort of outside Toronto, and um, and so I slowly saw saw it, you know, evolve over the years to I think we're close to. 800,000 plus now and such an like a city booming city and 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 you know uh, a lot of uh, residential area g going up a lot of the farms cut down and putting to homes and residential areas and a lot more schools being built so it was really kind of great to be kind of here um growing up in this place uh, and seeing everything from its sort of infancy to where it is today and, um, you know, going to school here, went to college here as well, too. And I really enjoyed that, enjoyed, you know, my entire education system. And, and even the weather, I mean, it's really funny because we used to have, I remember as a girl riding my bike uh, in my sort of um, neighborhood street, 
kind of court area. And the weather, we don't like we'd have summer from something like June, like end of May, June to to early um sorry, end of uh, August. And then as soon as October hit, we would have like our first snowfall. And I'm not talking just like, you know, little flurries that we have now, but I'm talking like large drifts that would kind of cascade over the eavesdrops, kind of that picture perfect Christmas card um, scenery. And it was just amazing, you know, snow up to my knees. <laughs> I, I'd wear my snowsuit and go to school <laughs> and then kind of float through it all. So it's it's so nice to, you know those younger years and then sort of seeing it evolve over over time to like i said the city it is and and all of that sort of um you know environmental elements as well sort of lessening so you know we don't get as much snow anymore and it's certainly not i mean the snow first snowfall is always that picture perfect postcard look but after that forget it <laughs> goes into the slush and you know what that all looks like and and whatnot um and and i've my gosh i've i've been a part of uh you know uh, you know the snow seasons for a very long time here and I, I honestly I could do without it <laughs> so I'm happy when there's no more snow I don't mind the cold um you have to be Canadian to enjoy cold and honestly I've been to other parts of the world and the cold there doesn't really compare to the cold here whatever a similar temperature there could be here honestly it's going to be like another three to five degrees more brisker cooler Mm -hmm. edgier um than what you know is elsewhere and so that but that's canada for you and you gotta love that and that's what makes us canadian um <clears throat> so yeah so growing up it was great uh you know i went to a great high school and i uh, went to college and did some my background is in information technology but over the years i acquired other degrees degrees to kind of upscale my and upgrade myself um and I've also worked in all the three different sectors, blue collar, white collar, retail in the past. And, um, you know, and, and, you know, I'm also a parent uh, of a wonderful daughter who uh, herself right now is finishing university. And so, you know, my journey has been incredible. It's been fun. I mean, there's been challenges along the way as well, too. But um, I think my biggest challenge came um, later towards um, my mid-20s when I ended up uh, developing or being diagnosed with an eye disease called retinal pigmentosis and um, retinal pigmentosis is one of those uh, diseases that just you know you'd rather not have <laughs> and but it creeps up on on you and this you know there's no really rhyme or reason for it I mean they've got some idea from being hereditary to being sort of you know um, a mutation in cells and the DNA and this and that I mean um, and so there's lots of other uh, factors to it too but it's not something that anybody would really want and um you know to, to be part of their life and well it kind of crept in with me and over time you know gradually what happens is it depletes your um excuse me um your vision whether it's your central that may go first or uh if it's your peripheral then you'll end up with like a tunnel vision kind of uh, thing going on until it's completely depleted and uh, so there's different variations of it. And every RP patient that you talk to, you're going to find that they're like different in their sort of experiences, outcomes, and just basically their overall health. Um, and so, you know, that was a bit of a shocker and I had to kind of deal and cope with that, um, especially since I was... Um, uh, was kind of diagnosed when I was on mat leave and <laughs> and so that was kind of a shocker and um, and then so after um, you know I had my baby I never just really returned back to work I just kind of slowly started dealing with uh, this new lifestyle change in this new uh, diagnosis and motherhood so it was a, a grand old uh, you know fun time at that point in my life and um, and then slowly, you know, just um, started to, was more of a domestic engineer in those days because I was mostly focused on raising my daughter and um, kind of deal with this uh, new lifestyle change uh, due to the diagnosis. And, um, you know, so it's just been sort of a interesting and challenging ex uh, life experiences and, uh, since then, uh, Dr. Randall. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. No, no. Thank you. For, no, yeah. Well, one, one I, I, I never knew that about you. I, 
<laughs> there, there is there's one there's one part that she she did leave out, oh. and she you're I, Nazarene, you're right you're right in my niche. Of okay. Humanity. You really really are. It says you're a fan of glass art. I like. <gasps> oh yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, there, were, there were things on here that just grabbed me when I when I read it. Oh, if, let me, let me tell you about that story. So, <clears throat> and uh, don't, don't, I'm going to go backwards again a little bit. So, okay. when I was little, um, my uncle at the time he worked for a factory here in town. Again, you know, it was just a the factory apparently is still here these many years, and uh, and it's called Consumers Glass, and he worked there, and basically they made you know beer bottles and all kinds of other. Um, uh, glassware, like bottles mostly, clear bottles, colored bottles. Anyways, he um, brought home one day a, a vase, and it was blue. And then he brought home uh, a statue of uh, a woman and a man sort of embraced with a, a sheet sort of like over them or however the etching lines were and everything. And they were just beautiful. Two, two of the most beautiful things I'd ever seen as a little, you know, uh, five seven year old girl and I never imagined glass could ever be colorful I thought glass was always going to be translucent you know you can see through it it's going to be you know that clear color kind of like my glass storm door my windows you know you're five seven year old kid <laughs> you don't you don't think you know and you know that your world is small and limited <laughs> so he brings these home and I was just I fell in love with the colors and I admired the etchings on them and I was just and then when the light the sunlight went through them the pyramid of color that scoped through it was just like mm -hmm. amazing and so I just never thought glass could ever be colored and I just um and ever since then my my love of uh, glass has always increased and I'm always looking for glass like like art and then I I went to cathedrals and stuff and churches as a, a young girl through school and and um <clears throat> We went and, you know, on field trips and stuff. And what amazed me were those beautiful stained glass windows up there. And I would just look at the colors and, and the designs and, and try to kind of see what I could see through them. Like, you know, because sometimes the stained glass could have a picture of it yep. uh, etched in there. And so I was just always kind of looking through and figuring out as a little girl, how did you get all those little panels of glass together like that? How did they do that? <laughs> Very so, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so my my love of glass art kind of started really young but then um where I live I never really found anything up until like um uh about 10 12 years ago I came across a, a, an emporium store that actually sold um a glass flowers and the minute I saw these beautiful yeah. glass flowers I'm yep. like, I have to have all that I have to have them all and and then I bought them all and then I saw another place here in the mall at Christmas time um, they used to sell glass. Um, it, it, he, he's an Italian designer, actually, and he, um, he, he's, uh, he designs like uh, figurines, mm -hmm. animals, flowers, birds, hummingbirds, um, bird baths, you know, those um, really beautiful pieces, angels, and they would put an exhi exhibition in the plaza. And so I bought a book. And when I saw that, I was just like, OK, stand back. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I need. I'm coming here to, and you know, I, I need these. And I came in and I, they were just absolutely beautiful because they were all lit around the exhibit. And um, they had like 24 gold etched in certain parts through it. So that there was the glass with the 24 karat gold. And if you bought like, let's say a flower, there was also like, so there was different other colors, like blues and pinks and reds, depending on what you bought, flowers or hummingbirds or what have you. And there was all kinds of animals from little piglets to rabbits and wow. all kinds of stuff so I started buying pieces one after the other because I just like this is oh my god I found them found glass art finally and over the years I've collected it and uh, truth be told I broke some too because <laughs> they're fragile <laughs> as you know <laughs> so that's where my um my love of glass art has come. Um, one of my things on the bucket list is I think nearby somewhere about an hour or so away they have uh, the Corning Ware uh, glass factory where you can go and blow glass and learn how to do that. And that's one of the yes. things on my bucket list. <laughs> I have been, I have been there. They are though those guys that that blow the glass there. Mm -hmm. So I could sit and look at them for for hours. Wow! Yeah, wow! Have, it's just handling. Them. <clears throat> I mean, it's, 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 it's amazing. What I want to say was you're also passionate about social impaired projects, uh, the revel and you revel in the transformation of others, but mm -hmm. now, so here's one that nobody knows. 
you also like to ride roller crawl. <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so i mean um, so seriously the free feeling that you get whether it be <laughs> mental with others or the transformation of others or ride on a roller coaster there really is no difference that's true if you put it like that absolutely i agree yeah i mean it's it is so awesome you also love to travel and i've been all over, all over the world so i mean you know mm -hmm. the, the two of us that that's cool you listen to music I play mm -hmm. music. I write music. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and, and biggest, the biggest one, I mean, I swear to God, if I had a gong here, I'd bang it. You love coffee. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Oh, man. That's like, oh. <laughs> Sorry. There oh, is a simple man. side to me, too. <laughs> okay. Okay. A good cup of coffee, a good, I don't know, maybe an old movie or something like that on TV. Yeah. <laughs> Get my head out of, out of where it's going. And I, maybe the Oreo cookies could be. Oh, a, a good piece of tiramisu with that. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that, that and New York crumb cake. Oh, you got to have that. Got to have cheesecake. Definitely. Always. Definitely. Always. <laughs> That'll blow your mind. Now, with these things, with these things out there, mm -hmm. and that, what else? I mean, how do you take all of this and make people, you know, be part of that? This is what, this is what you and I do. This is what mm -hmm. makes us happy. These are things that free us of all, everything in our minds. What do you do to transfer what you know and what you feel to other people? That's a really good question. So a lot of it comes from the heart and soul and sort of enlightenment. When I, you know, when I first had, you know, was diagnosed, one of the things that was really difficult for me was just to kind of understand what on earth is this and what will it do and how will it debilitate me? Um, from all aspects of my life, like, will I, you know, how will I be a functioning mother? How will I be, you know, um, a functioning, you know, I'm, I'm a, I am a daughter to somebody. How will I be a functioning daughter? How will I, you know, be a functioning sister? How will I be a functioning myself? And that was the biggest thing. And, and so, you know, when I was going through things, I was kind of like grappling in the dark to kind of get back up on that horse again to ride again. Cause obviously, you know, um, I went to mainstream schools. I, I grew up here. Like, you know, I mean, I went, you know, through the quote unquote norm of mm -hmm. society. And then all of a sudden this lifestyle changed. So that was like really devastating and disheartening and really hard. And I had really no help at the time. And so one of my struggles and challenges with myself was to kind of um, figure out how to stand on my own two feet and find the right resources so that I can start to walk again or I'll go back to sort of a lifestyle that I can, you know, now like adopt to. And that was a little bit daunting, but I did my own self teachings and my own self help. And I went through that sort of court, you know, slowly, slowly through it. And I had some, you know, people and, you know, in, in sort of so-called friend circles and stuff, you know, ask me all kinds of questions like, what are you doing? Cause basically they're, you know, like, what are you doing now? Or what, what can you do now? And it was kind of like those kind of questions are kind of hard hitting because it's like, well, yeah, what can I do now? What should I do now? Um, how can I help myself? And then, excuse me, you have lots of people telling you what to do, how to do it. Lots of people saying, okay, well, you're just like, okay, you know, you, you're, you're good as a companion. Let's tag along. Let's go shopping. Let's go this and let's go that because, you know, you, you poor thing can't do anything else, right? Like you can't um, have a professional identity or you, you know, what can you really do? And so that was kind of like challenging. So, you know, then I thought, well, I don't know this community and I don't know this world. So the first thing to do is to kind of understand this world and this community and the best thing and how to do that is to, to join it and to uh, get training and learn how to do that. So I joined some online, you know, courses and online platforms where the, where the disabled community would hang out and, you know, and I would kind of see what they were doing. And because I, kind of consider myself from both sides of the track now that I can bring in a lot of things and insight and, and, and useful ideas and, and sort of a larger scope from the world I once knew because I navigated it to the world I now am and so slowly I started to you know but I needed to learn and understand um, the sort of the world I am in today those folks who are they what do they look like what do they do how did they cope? How did they get through their day? What tools and technologies do they use? 
Um, and so then I started, like I said, you know, just joining their communities, learning from them, peer to peer learning, joining some online courses so that I could better my own sharpen my own skills and, and better myself so that, you know, down the road, I could maybe think of uh, being employable uh, or at least volunteer work, you know, baby steps, right, was the big thing here. And so joining those platforms, I really found sort of camaraderie. I found like likeness, like-mindedness. I found different types of people um, in, the, in, in those platforms, people that uh, for me, you know, it was a very new learning experience and new exposure. And so I found people that were, you know, um, born completely blind. And, and I also found people that were like sort of um, later in life, as I call them, that kind of go through the change like I did. And so that was kind of like interesting because I started to sit there and analyze a lot of it, but in a good way to kind of figure out, okay, how do the later in life folks kind of how what 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 do they bring to the table how are they <clears throat> and then the people who have been totally blind how did they adjust what is their world, world like and so I would sit there and I would you know just participate and I would sponge all of this in and then it really kind of dawned on me that you know um there's a lot I could bring to both sides here because I am from you know now I'm in the middle I was one side now on this side but I have a larger scope and vision and insight and so then that's my, my interest in sort of, you know, I, I started to think, well, how could I make a difference in the lives of some of these people? What could I, how could I help them? And at first the opportunity was not there. And so I, you know, I was okay with that. I just continued to, uh, convert, you know, just communicate and keep, you know, keep in tune with the people and kind of understand, okay, you know, also what are their social aspects now? What do they do socially? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> in their lifestyle change. Because I mean, I used to go and play soccer and badminton and all kinds of things. And now what do these folks, well, what do we do? And so uh, for me, being in that sort of stagnant box at that time and, and learning from these folks was very important for my own self-growth and self, you know, um, uh, esteem and all of that other good stuff and I learned a lot from them by just observing them having conversations whether it was through Skype you know in group chats or whether it was in an online you know platform learning a technology or taking online courses and being with you know the group and learning from sort of a you know my first time ever learning from um, a blind teacher and then how that how that was taught uh, my teachers were always cited so that was kind of an interesting, you know, new, new thing for me. And, and then just, so I sponged everything up. I, I analyzed things and I took it all in to the point of, um, you know, I, I make fun of this, but I kind of had to do um, uh, IT twice in my life. <laughs> First time without a screen reader. And the second time I did it with a screen reader. And um, because I wanted to better myself. And personally, I wanted to be able to use my you know, my machine, my computer a lot better because the computer um, was sort of the window to the world for me. And I did a lot of things with it now that I had it and I didn't have to rely on others. It kind of freed up, you know, my daughter's time and others time to help me. And I felt independence. And that was really important to me because, you know, obviously my independence had been lost and crushed as a result of the diagnosis and slowly, slowly the, the transition. Um, and you know, so this is great. Like, Hey, I've got a new lease on life through this computer. And so why not learn how to use it better? Platforms have changed since I've been there. Oh, what's this new thing? Internet. We didn't have internet when I was taking it the first time. So, <laughs> on, a, on a CD you got for free at the, at the market. Oh, we didn't even have CDs in my time. Not to tell you how old I am, but, <laughs> but we didn't even have CDs. Um, oh. Like yeah. AOL was AOL was given away for free. And so <laughs> was Earthling. Yeah. You, well, when you leave when you would leave the store and you would go out of a grocery store or yeah. something like that with your food, they would throw one in your back. <laughs> for good measure. Yeah. yeah. No. I to to well, the the mouse the mouse was the biggest thing when I was um, taking taking information technology back in college and when I took it it was we were just a small group of girls they didn't know we were only 10 of us because you can go to medical secretarial or information so we went into information technology there was 10 of us and um uh they thought we thought it was a secretarial course but we were completely wrong and then um i think a year or two later i came in 
um, to to do, you know, to, to drop off something or whatever. And all, you know, everything's changed. And then now it's all saturated with guys in there. We've got colored screens. And I'm like, oh, my God, the whole technology is totally changed. But anyways, um, so, so you know, that's why I thought, well, I'll take information technology again. And this time I took it with a screen reader, which for my own, for my own usage to see how this graphical user interface platform is going to be like and stuff like that. Because obviously I missed the boat on it um, due to the RP. <laughs> so... Um, so it was fun. So it was a fun class and, you know, it, that was a great opportunity to kind of, uh, meet more people and then, you know, sort of re rebuild myself on that. That was my first stepping stone sort of to, to that, um, to re to reeducating, you know, part of the reeducation, um, cycle for myself and self-help for myself. And then through uh, that opportunity, somebody had given me a tweet about Project Starfish. Actually, somebody had tweeted about Project Starfish and they sent, they forwarded me that information. But this was found in a tweet and this project is opened up and you might like to join this. So at first I was just kind of like, okay, well, we'll get to it. Cause I was in my final exams and uh, online final exam that I was doing. So I thought I was, my concentration was really there. And after that, um, somebody, you know, then I decided, well, um, you know, that uh, I heard the platform was sort of getting bigger and taking off a little bit. And uh, I was, again, advised to, to, to look into it. And it took me a couple other weeks before I actually um, decided to go back on the website, read about it, picked up the phone and called the founder, um, Subhashish Acharya, um, and called him. And then, you know, um, we, we ended up talking for a little while, a couple hours about you know, uh, the initiative and, and everything. And then the rest is history. I ended up joining the project. And um, what I really loved about the project is that it was, um, not everybody understood it. Um, <clears throat> the project had many different facets to it and not everybody understood it. And everybody was just kind of like, they thought it was, you know, it, it kind of came in with one different, um, like, sort of uh, model and then over the time you know the model did change slightly but at best in the beginning the model was designed to help folks with disabilities um, you know find a place where they could get some work experience in experiential learning platform so the platform was designed that the old career center model was kind of dismantled in this model because um in a career center, you walk in with your resume, you read the job boards, you get assistance to help look for a job. And, you know, you may or may not find one that's suitable to you and you can apply, apply anywhere and everywhere you want to apply. Um, and sort of the, the project was designed in a way that it would be more like a farmer, farming and hunting kind of, I guess, um, think tank ground, if you will, sort of a think tank of sorts. Uh, where you farmed and hunted and so and, and you know and then you were able to build up those skills those soft skills that we call them that you could be more a workforce ready um the initiative behind the project is really about you know um Subhashish, uh his passion for also helping people he was at a job fair in boston and there was a vendor's market there and um, the vendors were there. He was there on a different type of, like he was there with doing a documentary with somebody and just assisting. And basically there was a whole group of folks with disabilities there, um, dressed in their Sunday best with their canes, uh, dogs and, and, you know, guide people. And he went to approach one of the vendors there and said, Hey, you know, we got a good crowd out here. And this is a great, great group of folks coming out here to apply for, uh, you know, for these jobs. Uh, how many are you planning to hire? And the response that the gentleman gave him at the at the booth was just disgusting, disheartening, and you know, depressing. Is basically the man said, "Oh, I have no intentions of hiring any of these folks. We just asked them to come out to dress in their Sunday best to make them feel good and give them purpose. Like just so, so it was sort of like a false falsehood there that was kind of, you know. And he was just really like disheartened. So he went back and he thought about how can I change this? This is the this is the the general model." a job fair, a vendor fair. People drop off their resumes, talk to employers, potential employers, this and that. <clears throat> How can I make it so that they're actually doing something themselves and standing out above and beyond this kind of um, uh, platform? 
And so that's where the, the idea of Project Starfish came to be. And it's, you know, an experiential learning platform that helps people to regain skills and um, get employable so that they can, you know, get integrate back into the job market of today and at least have, excuse me, at least have those fundamental skills that, you know, if you, uh, that you all need, the contemporary skills that everybody needs, must have, and, um, you know, to be able to then layer on a specialty later because you never know where you're going to end up. And if you can't have the fundamental skills, um, then employers don't have time to teach you those skills. And a lot of um, sometimes voc rehab doesn't go the extra mile either. And um, experience is the best teacher. So when through the project, we were able to, you know, design an, an, an um a simulated business, if you will. And the whole thing was a simulated business. That's why I said not a lot of people understood what it was and why it was and how, how it was. And if you had an idea, uh, and if you could make it work and you can get a team together to help you develop that idea and execute it, right there you were acting as a project manager. You had a team, you were completing a project and you were using every soft skill that we that was there. So. You know, so the platform was um, a great place for that kind of thing. And and my when I got there, I, I understood what the scope of it was that, the you know, the founder had put together. And so, you know, one of the ch we were each asked, what would you like to do? And what I wanted to do was to do basically <clears throat> HR. I wanted to be pe the first person they saw when they you know, sort of entered and the last person they saw when they exited the business. So, again, that's going to HR. And, um, and then the other thing was like, you know, um, we designed, we wanted to focus on peer to peer learning because I have some skills or I have some strengths. You might have some strengths, Dr. Randall, somebody else, you know, Bob might have some strengths, but if we put our strengths all together, we can learn from one another and we can move forward together, um, without having to, you know, put down so much dollars to go to college, you know, if, if the time doesn't permit. Um, and you know what I'm trying to say? So it was kind of a peer to peer learning, which was very effective. And, um, that kind of model was also the, the inner workings of the, mo of the entire model ship mess of it. And, um, so we, you know, the first thing we did was then that's what I wanted to do. And others were into business development and some people did social media marketing. Well, actually social media marketing came up in 2016, but you know, others people did a lot. The other arm was uh, business development. And so I, 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 I went into the HR side and then I, I resurrected the entire portion or corner of that and onboarded people and put, you know, processes into place. And then also the training had to be, so we thought, well, peer-to-peer -peer learning, we need to design a training program that would be effective for everyone to learn. And so then what are these fundamentals and contemporary soft skills that need to be, be learned? And so we designed that platform, we put it together, and then we had trainings. And we would, you know, then outreach to, you know, different organizations at state levels, and national levels to, to get our word out and to, to, find, um, to find folks that wanted to be trained. And, you know, word of mouth as well, too. And so in the last um, five years, since the project's been open, and this June it will be six, we've trained over three to 400 folks with, the, you know, visual impairments and sometimes multiple disabilities as well, too. So it's been a fantastic and fascinating ride at the project. Um, but then again, with like everything else, trends, you know, trends come and go and, and time changes. And so come 2017, you know, we, we decided, um, actually, I met you in 2016 when we actually put the 20, um, social media component together because most of our 2014 and 15 was developing, you know, the training of contemporary skills and, and soft skills and, and our business development. We also, um, at that point, were working with uh, outreaching to, sorry, outreaching to startup and scaling businesses because one of the things that the founder decided, uh, thought that was really a bonus was to, to get projects in from startup companies and scaling companies where the CEO had didn't have a lot of time to, do everything and needed some hands helping hands in the area of time suck as they call it in the terminology <laughs> and um and so you know we we um would reach out to scaling startup companies and 
get them on projects, you know, get them on a call, um, you know, like this. And we would talk and, you know, we would end up trying to, you know, work on extract and negotiate projects with them. And then we would, you know, in return for that, they would give us some monetary uh, gains. And those were small bonuses that the, the teams working on the projects would get as a small stipend, you know, as an encouragement. And also to kind of give them the sense that, hey, you know, you folks can be employable. You can be, you know, and this is what, you know, um, working feels like. And here's a little bonus. This is, you know, a little small stipend. And look, you know, this is what getting, you know, uh, a stipend at the end of the day, what it feels like. And a little few dollars or pennies in your pocket, so to speak, what that sense of independence and empowerment um, can do for you. And so it was all combined in the entire ecosystem of the project and its sort of uh, meaning and focus. And, you know, so everything we did was in a simulated concept, except that when we were working on the projects, you know, with the, the small startup companies, um, we were actually doing work for them that was of value to them. And that gave us the experience that, you know, you needed to get out there in the real world. And so we had that model um, for a while. Then in 2016, when I met up with you, Dr. Randall, um, we had our 60 Minute to Impact yeah. platform open. Yes. And that basically was also bringing people together. A lot, again, people, some understood it, some didn't understand it. And that platform was basically about communication styles, moderation, um, you know, getting, you know, um, uh, using some of the soft skills to kind of track down um, uh, uh, candidates for the interview and reaching out to them and having those conversations to get them on the line. And then, you know, then having somebody to mediate the call and moderate the call. And then, you know, all everything was recorded so that we would then, you know, then through social media, uh, then bring in the concept of social media marketing and branding, have the people learn what that was and how to strategize on a different campaign. So like when we had you on Dr. Randall, you know, we, we learned your backstory. We understood your backstory. And then we ended up, you know, going to some of your websites and, you know, doing some research on you, getting, putting together a profile on you. And then, you know, we designed a campaign strategy around you and then designed tweets that we would send out to our followers, you know, on all the socials or what have you, Facebook, et cetera. And we, we, we would actually, you know, uh, promote our speakers. We promoted you as well too, uh, through that. Now that became a learning part of the learning exercise and ecosystem for what social media marketing and branding is about. And those are great fundamental uh, learning building blocks for anybody coming through our system and our platform. And you couldn't get that even at a college level, even if you tried, because it, although it was not a textbook uh, oriented to the period, if you know what I mean. It was better than that because it was fun. It was peer-to-peer -peer learnt. It was everybody was all hands on deck to learn this. And everybody took a part in, you know, what they wanted to do, what they liked to do, or their strengths. We leveraged their strengths. And everybody, you know, got to, you know, work in teams, collaboration, network, all the big heavy keywords and buzzwords that you do on the job were actually done hands on there. And that's how we were able to get you on, <laughs> Dr. Randall. And, you know, all the other all the other guests that we got on and people would also have time take turns moderating or asking questions. And that's when you were talking about being exposed to people around the world. We had people at that time in 2016, we had over, I think, nine or 10 to 12 different countries represented. And, you know, if every one of those people, they were asked to tweet it out in their um, networks, imagine where you start here in the U.S. and you have many other groups or people, There's, you know, India, Philippines, Malaysia, Denmark, UK, Australia, where, um, you know, the, the recordings would go once we, we were done processing them, we would, you know, tweet, put them on the socials for people to, to listen to them thereafter. And so imagine where all of that has kind of gone through um, all over the world. And it was a great idea and a great platform. And uh, sort, of, sort, of, sort of sad to see it kind of go. Um, but, you know, every, all good things must come to an end, <laughs> as you know. <laughs> 
Um, and then in 2017, what happened was that we ended up having to change the model slightly because the times asked for it. Folks, the people that were coming in for training at that time, they were a different breed of people than we had before. These people were a little bit more, they wanted more, they were a little bit more, I would say, on the education level. A lot of them were people who were the later in life who were losing their vision for to whatever you know, glaucoma or RP or whatever have you, and we're in that lifestyle change and wanted to reskill themselves. Um, then we had people, and they also, some of them had like, they were entrepreneurs, so they also carried other, uh, like, you know, biz, like they had business sense. Um, they had their own businesses. And, but they came to the platform for, you know, soft skills and, and workforce training and job readiness and just to, uh, to see how the platform could help them out on on their uh day to day and excuse me we realized that at this point people were mostly interested in employment at the end of the training and they really wanted that and so our prior projects were always smaller in nature working with the startup and scaling businesses or and you know and so therefore the stipends were you know uh, smaller there was more volume of work but the stipend was a little smaller because it was a monetary bonus at the end of it. And these people were different. They wanted more of the monetary gain at the end of it and long-term consistency with that, which is understandable because anybody on SSI and SSDI wants to kind of come off. And so that was understandable. And so what we ended up doing um, is that we, you know, we'd still worked in the simulated space. We developed new processes and business management sort of an MBA level and we worked on those type of projects and simulated um, exercises with the group that was the through 2017. At the end of 2017 we decided that we're going to completely shift the model. Um, you know times have come call for it now and um, we also had put in some um, new markers such as like before our platform was uh, extremely like it was there was no feed for it for the consumer coming through for training. But with all the time and money invested in us and us being around for a while and being the only platform like that, we decided that it was time now to kind of, you know, um, and rightfully so, you know, we ca to, to put some fees on for the training that we did charge, you know, that we, sorry, that we did do. And, you know, so that also kind of helped us, um, I guess, weed out the people who felt that they could, you know, couldn't, um, uh, I mean, it was a very small stipend too. We didn't go very high either. It was something very affordable because we knew people were on the system, <clears throat> but there were some people that just couldn't meet, the, meet that mark. And there are other people who obviously met it and surpassed it, but were looking for employment at the end of it. So we decided at the end of 2017 to kind of change things up and to just, you know, exit from that out. And so now where we are with the project is we do one-on-one -on -one training, somebody looking for something uh, for contemporary skills. Um, we customize the training for them. And, you know, we, we still do charge for our training. Um, we work and negotiate that with them. And we, you know, um, customize the program for what they need. And, you know, we've helped, you know, so many people thereafter as well, too. Um, you know, last year when I was away, um, uh, you know, I was working with somebody overseas um, who was uh, uh, doing, uh, who wanted to customize his training for him prior to that. And he's in, he was, sorry, he's in construction and um, somebody who, um, <clears throat> was doing cabin trees and, and construction work and wanted to sort of um, um, learn some um, contemporary skill building skills that they, he didn't have. So we worked with him and customized his program. Prior to that, I was working with a lady who was in the Wall Street um, doing stock broking and things like that, but couldn't read those um, stock uh, charts anymore, those little books. And so um, she wanted to learn how to do everything that she did with her mouse now with a screen reader. So we customize this program for her. So and there's been many other examples of that and um, since then. And, and so that's what we're up to now. And um, the other thing we were also doing is that we partnered up with a company out of Atlanta, Georgia called the Sourcing Foundation. And we had run a pilot in 2015 um, with those folks there in recruiting and sourcing space. Never heard of before folks with disabilities doing recruiting and sourcing, like really. Um, it was a college level course. We were the first sort of folks to go through it and uh, it was a pilot. And so we went through it, we were successful. 
um, I project managed the whole thing. And, you know, within about 40, 45 days, we, we finished the whole track, got our certificates and diplomas from that and accreditation. And so um, we ended up partnering up with the source, with the sourcing foundation. And um, uh, in 2018, it was time for, I guess, uh, them to run another pilot. And so they ran another pilot with uh, the state of Vermont, Voc Rehab, and pro the project and the Sourcing Foundation and another group uh, in Vermont on the ground called Orion Global Talent. And, you know, a few more folks with disabilities, very visual acuities went through that pilot. And that was also successful. And at that time, then at that time, you know, they, they were, um, they'd asked me to help with the orienteering. And, you know, one of the questions I was asked was, what were some of the challenges you guys experienced when you went through this? And I said, well, basically, when we went through it in 2015, we had no parachute. Like, we had nothing. We just throw it into it, go sink and swim, go do it, be done on the other side. Had we had some orienteering or we had, you know, we had a parachute, we, we would have been okay. So then I designed the orienteering program for them. And then after that, I've been sort of um, between the two nonprofits sort of, you know, um, was absorbed kind of, you know, to facilitate people going through the training on the sourcing foundation side, as well as anybody taking our training on the project side. If they have an interest in the recruiting and sourcing, then, you know, we always um, guide them that way as well, too. Um, so that's where I've kind of, you know, where we are today, um, Dr. Randall. And, um, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's been an interesting journey. Um, it's not a unique one, but it's certainly been an interesting um, journey, you know, to say, to say the least. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I've learned a lot about you, but see, uh, why it's even uh, more uh, confirmation for me why I asked you on the show, you know, you're a leader. And you're, hungry. <laughs> and, and you're darn creative. Okay, now I didn't know about the RP for you because uh, one of my closest friends that I met at blind school, uh, you know, that, that was his journey, except that he started, he was uh, experienced that very young in life. And, you know, you can see the, the how people's personalities go because, you know, he was probably five or six mm -hmm. and he saw this envelope on his dad's desk from, you know, the eye doctor. And he goes, okay, well, this is actually about me. Let me open this up. And he goes, what is this retinitis pigment? What is this <laughs> thing? He goes, then, you know, there's no internet back then. So he, had to, he looked it up going, oh, crap, I'm going to go blind. <laughs> and, you know, the kid's five, six years old. And he, it, yeah. like, uh, you know, one of those kind of things where, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, personality you have the, the day you're, you're born, but then your, your subconscious mind is being groomed third trimester in, in pregnancy up until about age eight. And this is when you, you, you learn yeah. more by, uh, uh, just hypnosis, okay, and, and then it, it's mm -hmm. this one. It's a weird thing with learning, and from the age eight on, it's uh, alpha and beta brain waves, and it's uh, you know repetition, mother skill, and that's how you learn. But th this kid, you know, like you, just was uh, just highly uh, academically involved and uh, just in in there. But he he knew very uh, early on he was going to go blind. And you know the thing is, you're you're a kid and you're out playing, and all of a sudden when it gets dark, he goes, oh no, it's getting dark. I gotta get home. <laughs> and then, wait, Tim, stay, stay, let's play. No, I, I'm going to get lost, you know. Or you, yeah. you have your first school dance, and finally a girl pays attention to you. Hey, Tim, meet me by the concession stand. Okay. <laughs> and then he, he, he goes, he goes, he goes there. It, it took him two hours to find it. Okay. Oh. There, it's not there. And he goes, wow. you know, okay, there you go. My, my, my first and last chance of romance. But anyway, you know, he ended up going to University of Colorado and getting a, you know, his thing was business. And then he get, ended up, uh, got his MBA uh, at the University of Washington and becoming a teacher there for the business school. And said, wow, you know, that's really good. And then from there, kind of like you, uh, the, the, the print got started getting smaller, smaller, and smaller. So he goes, I can't see. You know, I really can't see. And then uh, his, his classes were full, but curiously, they didn't renew his contract. I go, hmm, weird about that, right? But anyway... I, I guess with you, Nazreen, why I had you on and why you so impressed me is that all the stuff with uh, your contribution to uh, Project Starfish, I did not know. You know, had uh, this, the, the knowledge gone uh, about Project Starfish to Services for the Blind, you know, and I live in the state of Washington, uh, 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 to, uh, you know, that department, I go, wow, there's something other than Services for the Blind where they go, hey, they teach you Braille, how to use the computer, and they go, hey, get out there, go get a job. Uh huh? Well, who do I talk to? Well, that's your problem. What do you mean? 
I thought you guys were going to, we don't know anybody in the business industry. Well, what am I, so what, you, you, you teach me this mechanical voice and how to use a cane and how to catch a bus and you tell them, go get them. I go, go get what? <laughs> okay, you know, so so you know, I ended up putting myself uh, through a couple years of graduate school in counseling psychology and addictions counseling and all, and found that you know just the, the academia was my thing in the past, but it didn't uh, serve my needs anymore because my life had changed. And uh, to answer your question there, or to add to it, you know, just regular college is general knowledge. What you mm -hmm. provide much more valuable than that because they don't teach you in college how to make a living. They don't teach you how to work mm -hmm. as a team. They don't teach you how to contribute and mm -hmm. because it's all, all about me. It's all about me. And then from there, it's memorize this. Then you get a grade. Aloha. There you go. Go for it. <laughs> no, and, and then it's like, oh, okay. I've got a college degree. Okay. Well, I, I, you know, I've got a scar on my butt. Okay. So what? <laughs> See, and so what you guys do is so it's much more valuable than that. You know, I think it's what college should be because unless you have practical experience, unless you can work as a team, unless you can draw out your own creativity, you don't know who you are. And then a lot of it is self-identity. And what you've learned is it, it's, it's beyond the self-esteem thing. Because self-esteem is, uh, you know, what you've done in life. Self-love is loving who you are as you are. Okay. And then I think you, you have to learn that because, you know, wow, I didn't choose this. And, well, oh, by the way, God, this is not fun. Okay. I'll just let you know. <laughs> it's not fun at all. <laughs> and, and then, but look, look who you've become and what you've done and what you've created because, you know, when, when I hear you talking here, you, you talk about a lot of the stuff that I teach, you know, which is one team concept. You work as a team and you, you got singular goals and everyone's got diff different ways to contribute. Let's find out what those ways are, but it's one team. You know, th there's no mega superstars here. You win as a team, you lose as a team. This is it. Okay. And you also express this thing of uh, how you, uh, you, you know, do your human resourcing thing is that uh, it's branding. You're creating a brand, you know, with folks and not only for, for the team itself, but for folks individually. You know, it's really quite brilliant. And, and that's why, you know, when I listen to you, I said, man, look, look what she's done. And, you know, I, I get inspired just listening to you. <laughs> I, you know, no, you. It, it's true because, it, you know, I go, Wow, she did that. Well, well I got to get off my ass, and maybe I can do something else too. <laughs> because that's what that is. Because what your concept of bringing people together uh, is it, so crucial. Because you know, yes, you know, we've all got some kind of physical or sense, you know, impairment and all that, and that will either define us in a good way or define us in a bad way. And if, if we use this to lift us up, then we can use it for us and for other people as a teaching tool. But if we use it to drag us down, then we become, oh, I've got some kind of excuse where I can blame and shame, and it's the world's fault, not mine. You know, screw all the rest of you, blah, blah, blah. You know, and then, then you get to learn negativity, and you, you, you activate law of attraction. The more of it you give, the more of it you get, the more negative you are, then, hey, here you go. This is your gift. You see, and so what yeah. you bring to the, the table is not only positivity, but you have to live it. You're not one to say, oh, well, for you, blind folk, blah, blah, you do this, do this. It goes, no, no, I lived it. And, you know, it ain't fun. And I had to find my way. And this was my way. And to share those experiences is gold. It's just gold. Okay? And then so you just kind of brought it in a very short time here, like where I think colleges fall down because colleges, I, I, I you know, I, I do like secondary education and all that. But to me, it's all general knowledge until you get to, say, uh, you, you know, a master's or doctoral program. And even those programs don't teach uh, how to w people who work as a team, uh, you know, how to, how to uh, you know, lead with their heart, you know, how to be creative, how to be mm -hmm. generous, how to be giving. And, you know, from there is that you memorize this, you memorize this. One big doctor, you memorize this. I go, what for? No, well, I don't know. You just memorize it. Well, <laughs> well. Well, you know, like body parts, you memorize the anatomy, okay, yeah. well, let's just work together. Look, if you want to go ask questions, why don't you go study on your own time? Memorize all the stuff here, and then you get your little doctor somebody, and you can get on, okay? Okay, fine. So, you know, see, what you bring is so much more valuable. Okay, th this is what I think true education is, and what you've done is that you bring people together, and now uh, you, you have to adapt, you know, to the changing times because you got all these entrepreneurs in, and, you know, we, you know, we want to make money. And it's uh, making money, uh, it's just, it's a tool, of course, but it, it tells you of, of uh, oh, value of what you mm -hmm. put in, and then you get something out of that. And, and then, and you know, we want to take care of our families too. Mm -hmm. And then and then you know this quite well, the world is looking to you. What's a blind girl going to do in life? Okay. <laughs> you know, 
Yeah, let's, yeah. Let's, let's give her a broom or something like that. Or she can answer the phone. People like that can answer the phone. <laughs> <laughs> you say and said, "Oh, okay, okay, okay." You know, stuff like that, or, or <laughs> you know, so she, she can hang up coats or something like that. I said, okay, "Well, I wasn't put on earth to, you know, sleep unless I really have to, and then or hang yeah. up and all that." I want to live my dream. You know, I want to be who I am. I, I want to mm-hmm. see where I can go because I don't know. And, yeah. and I've got this uh, this this sense loss here, but could that be an advantage? Could that make me a better person? Could that make me better and stronger? And it did for you, you know. And then what? What I find is a lot of folks aren't like you. Okay, they will use that impairment as a crutch, and from there they, you blame and shame the world, and that's how their work becomes. And it's it's sad to me. And so, had I known about Project Starfish while I was in blind school, as I call it, I go, wow. I said, well, what's this? Uh, you guys want to teach me braille and teach me how to use a cane, and you kick me out. Say, hey, good luck. Good luck for what? Where am I going? Yeah. <laughs> you see, and yours would be a, a t- totally different concept. In fact, you, uh, Project Starfish could actually train a lot of the uh, uh, blind agencies in our country, and all, all every state has one. Okay, and they, they do the minimal leases. You, here, you learn Braille, you, you learn kitchen skills, you learn how to catch a bus, you learn a cane use and all that. I said, okay, that's great. Uh, you know, I, I've been you know, self-employed for 30 years. I want to get back into the work, uh, you know, workforce because, you know, I know business. He goes, well, that's your problem. Well, how do I meet these people? That's your problem. Oh, okay. And, and, and so, you know, a lot of things go into that where you show up somewhere and then, you know, you're all decked up, but you've got your cane and then you say, hey, you're next. And I, I tap my way into somebody's office and I go, oh, who the heck are you? You know, <laughs> and a lot of that is not yeah. to chat about. And so, you know, what you bring up is so crucial, uh, you know, to this uh, part of our society, because, you know, soon there's going to be 8 billion people here on Earth. 20% have some kind of uh, physical sense disability, 20%. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. A lot of them are employed and a lot of them don't know where to go. Where do you go for help? I mean, you can't go to the services for the line. They go, hey, we teach you Braille. We teach you uh, cane skills. Go get them. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and it's like, oh, okay, well, how can I even get home? Well, you know, am I going <laughs> to get killed crossing the street? And, and so you sent me yours, I think, is uh, such a valuable, valuable concept. And you rolled with the times. You rolled with it. And uh, you notice things are changing because, you know, people, you know, they, 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 we want skills and all that, but we, we want to contribute to life much beyond the money part in, in our small earthly time on earth. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. if you live 100 years, many people don't. And uh, we want to contribute in some way, like, you know, I want to leave a legacy. You know, God put me on earth for some reason. I don't know what that is. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's a lot harder when you can't see. So you know, where do I go? And so that's where I think that... Uh, Project Starfish and subs, you know, and, and I like him a lot. And then, you know, you, you brought innovation to this darn thing. And you brought leadership. <laughs> you. You know? And then yeah. it, it, that's not only comes from the imagination and creativity, which is, you know, that, that, that's your uh, conduit. Uh, you, you know, what I tell people is where that the, the humanness of us uh, touches God, because God talks to you. Because, you know, uh, there's nowhere in your brain that has a part for imagination, the creativity, okay, that they, they can't find that part. It's out here. It's outside. Okay. And so that means you have a spiritual connection and you're thinking that way because imagination is spiritual. Because, you know, when you look, look at a Henry Ford or, or, or uh, uh, boy, you know, Thomas Edison, things like that, uh, you know, here, here's like our guys that are trying to do something that has never been done before. Okay, and, uh, and you know, uh, Tom said it's in a, a, a two years of schooling, and we've had much more. Okay, uh, uh, yeah, Henry Ford uh, could barely get to the sixth grade because he wasn't very bright. His parents wanted him to be a farmer. You know, Henry, you're not smart enough to do what you're doing. I'm going to create the first horseless carriage. What the hell is that? Well, it, it's something to do with the motor. And well, well how do you do it? I, I don't know because it's never been done before. And the same thing with the incandescent life, but never been done before. How do you do it? Failure, 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 failure. Oh, I found one way that doesn't work. I'm going to keep on going. Okay. <laughs> and and uh, that's where ingenuity comes from. That's where imagination comes from. And that's all spiritual. And that's what you bring to the table. And you bring a, you bring a big heart because you have to live through this going, you know, <laughs> I, hey. I want to live, to, to live a, a, a normal life, you know. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, so, and all of a sudden, uh, just, oh, shoot, what the heck is RP? Oh, let me look that up. <gasps> oh, really? Pretty devastating. Really? You Can know, you and it? there, it's like uh, when uh, you first start experiencing this, you know, man, this is going to go, you know, I, I've got to, one, become a different person. And then you know, the more you learn, you, you become, you, you grow. You learn by growing. And, and then you know, first, that's, that's growth. That's why I'm so passionate about helping people uh, when I where and when and where I can, um, you know, and trying to show them their potential and stuff like that. Because you know, I've had people who come to the project and you know they they literally cried explaining their story. You know, an initial conversation with them. They talked about you know RP. Um, you know, they talked about you know their challenges with it. And it's almost like listening to everybody's, you know, three, four hundred people's story over the five, six, you know, four or five years, it, it kind of, you know, hits you. So I'm very passionate about, you know, making a difference in their lives. And and that's why I focus on helping people. I don't know everything, I'll be honest, but if I don't know it, I'll try to know it. I'll try to help as best as I can. Um, anybody and every anyone who's, you know, wants to help and reaches out, you know, that's what we're here for, to help one another. And what what better way but this through the school of life, right? No, no, it's true. And see, see, that's what I mean. With, with what you do, it, is that uh, you provide hope for folks. Because you know, once you you lose hope, it, it you pretty much are lost. Okay, once you lose hope, that, that that feeling of hope, everything is lost because now you don't care, and, and all that. So the folks that come to you, and you know, of course, they they gotta gush out, uh, you know, the, the, their story. And you know, I really enjoy people's stories, and you've got a powerful one of your own. I listen to you and I go, oh, good grief, man. <laughs> yeah. Because it, it's like you're right. there's a difference when you're you're born blind or mm -hmm. you go through life as you had. And all these experiences that you, you had, primarily visual, you get to ride your bike. Okay. Oh, yeah. And, and you, you, you get to play ball. You get to play tennis or things like that. You get to go to school. You, you say, hey, you need to study for the SIFs. You get your book out and you start reading. Yeah. Okay. Th that that changes radically <laughs> and, okay. and the same thing is uh where's the bathroom oh really it's that <laughs> on the corner and up the stairs oh okay you know things like <laughs> that. Uh, hey, hey where's your house oh, it's down the road to the left uh okay yeah it, it's the greenhouse uh oh okay. <laughs> you see and you're going all right all right and then you know the same thing when you talk about your friends you know what are they thinking about and feelings? You know, we, we like her, but what do we do with her when we invite her? <laughs> you can't see the game. Okay, I, well, I got to tell her, you know, that in the home team scored a goal or something like that, or, you know, things like that, or, you know, the, the beer on the left is the light beer, the one on the, the, the right. <laughs> and I go, okay, what do you do with her, right? And so th they themselves are going, okay, you know, we still love her, but what do we do with her? Okay, and the, <laughs> do I invite her out to a movie? Is that rude or something like, yeah, things like that. So, uh, you know, the dy dy dynamics change when, when you change. And so with, with your uh, friends, you go, okay, you, you test them because they go, what we do with Nazarene? Well, we like her, but it's not the same. <laughs> so they, they had to relearn things. And then, uh, you know, so did you. And uh, on this road, you found your passion. You like up on folks. Because you know what's the neat thing is that you don't know everything. Because if you did, we'd have to call you God. <laughs> uh, hey, God. <laughs> and, uh, what is the ending on God? Yeah. <laughs> yes, right. Well, he, they, uh, him and JC are my buddies anyway, so no problem. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, what I was going to say was that we're at the end now. So yeah. this is what we have to do. We have to get information. In other words, Nazarene. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. How can we get in touch with you? How can someone listening right now get in touch with you? And where's your website so that they can go in there and know you better? Um, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, our website, I will tell you, be honest with you, um, it's a little bit, uh, we're, we're working on the, the back end of it. So it's a work in progress. So you can find us at, at uh, www.peasandpeterstarfish.com. Dot org. That's www.pstarfish.org. Or you can always pop us a mail at hr at pstarfish.org and uh, just address it to me and, you know, make sure you have your contact information in there and maybe a possible resume. And uh, I'll be more than happy to get back in touch with you all. 
That is awesome. And we also have some more information is in the chat room right now, and that is for sourcing, uh, sourcingfoundation.org. Yes, absolutely. So if you want to know more about recruiting and sourcing, because a lot of folks with disabilities can do sourcing work from home, it's it's pretty easy. Once you learn, the um, you know, go through the online course, um, you just need your computer, your internet, and obviously working phone. And uh, if you want to reach me for the sourcing, um, you know, to, to learn more about recruiting and sourcing, how you can get involved and take the online course, you can reach me at nazreen at sourcingfoundation.org. And Nazreen is N-A-S is in Sam, R-E-E-N is in Nancy, at sourcingfoundation.org. You can pop me an email and uh, I'd be more than happy to, to get in touch with you. Well, there you go. Doctor. Hey, thanks so much. Hey, thank you. There you go. That's Reed. Thank, thank you, Bob and uh, Dr. Randall, for having me on your you platform. Were, uh, you're gonna have to. You're gonna have to come back though, because we could definitely go into this deeper. Are you serious? <laughs> oh, yeah. oh yeah. Do it again. Do it again. All right, you wow. got. Be good. God thank bless you. Take care, all. Bye. Bye. Charles. Ow!